Hi there, and thanks for listening to the Adulting is Easy podcast. This is Lauren, and I manage the Adulting is Easy blog and podcast, both of which can be found at realadultingiseasy.com. The podcast can be found pretty much anywhere you listen, which speaking of, if you are listening, whatever platform you're on, please take a minute and hit the follow button if you can safely do so. I'm joined today by Alan Corey, an Atlanta-based realtor and real estate investor and the author of the best-selling book, House Fire, about reaching financial independence and retiring early through real estate. A former comedian turned real estate mogul, Alan makes real estate fun and interesting to help guide others on their path to financial freedom. Thanks for joining me, Alan. Lauren, it's my pleasure. Our goal for today is to make adulting a bit easier for our listeners by discussing a personal finance topic, since managing money is a big part of adulting. So today, Alan, you and I are going to discuss FIRE through real estate. But first, let me say that I absolutely love your writing style. What made you want to write the book? Did you think that nobody was writing in your style or, or what, what made you want to write House Fire? Yeah, well, so um, I, I, as you mentioned, I was a former comedian, and so um, I, I always wanted to be a comedy writer. And so um, I moved to New York City, fresh out of college, big city, big dreams, and that didn't work out well. I, I, I couldn't pay my rent with with laughs, apparently. So um, I always always wanted writer that writing that was a passion of mine, and my other passion is real estate. So I devoured every single book I could on real estate. And they're all so boring and textbook. And, um, you know, if, if you're not already passionate about real estate, they're, they're, they're difficult to read. So I've always wanted to create books about money for that reader or that um, audience who might be intimidated by personal finance or find it droll or just uh, as a sleep aid to read a personal finance <laughs> book. I, I wanted to change that and make it entertaining, but also informative at the same time. That is so true, especially when you get into you have some 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 money analysis in your book, but sometimes it's like spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet. I'm like, man, good thing I really like this stuff so I can get through it. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So it, it, if I can make a, a book that like my wife will read or my parents will read, then I'm like, okay, uh, you know, because they're not interested in real estate like I am, and they both actually enjoyed it and could talk to me about it and have a conversation with with me about it. I, I, I consider it a success. And you did say financial books. Do you want to let um, listeners know that this is not your first book? Sure, sure. So I've I've documented pretty much my entire money path. My first book was called A Million Bucks by 30, which was pro- uh, published by Random House um, around 2008, 2009. And um, that was how I became a millionaire before 30. And really, it was the lean fire principles that I used. Fire stands for financial independence, retire early. If you're not familiar with lean fire. This was before lean. It was called lean fire, but it was basically living way below your means. Um, I had a $50,000 salary in New York city, but I lived off $19,000 of it. I was eating ramen noodles every single day. I was eating day old bagels that were free at the bakery. I was doing the most extreme frugal living as possible and investing the rest. Uh, and I did that for a decade and was able to become a millionaire before 30. Then part two was the real estate crash came and the economy went down and all my genius ideas from a million bucks by 30 weren't working for me. So um, <laughs> I recreated my um, my basically my career. I started a career from scratch and I document and I, and I, my goal was how do I create a six figure career in two and a half years. I, I gave myself two and a half years to have a $100,000 career from zero. And so that's what my book, The Subversive Job Search is about. All the sort of um, spy tactics and underling uh, methods that I use to negotiate higher paying jobs and to get myself um, called in for interviews for jobs that I really wasn't qualified for. And I did really cool things in this for, that I teach in the subversive job search book, which was published around 2013, um, such as reverse engineering um, the job that you want by taking the, the 10 job titles that across 10 different companies for the job that you want that you're not ready for yet, but you want to be in maybe three to five years, put them in a word cloud, and um, which is just a free online tool. And what happens is you take 10 job listings, throw them all in a word, word cloud, the, the words that appear the most often 
jump out at you. They get bigger. It, it's a it's a visual display, and so the, the most repetitive words have a bigger font size. And you just look. You do that, and um, I, I realize I just need to have those words in my resume, and um, or get those certificates or whatever, because this is what's universal for that job title. And, and so I, I did things like that, and I was able to create a hundred and fifty thousand dollars salary in New York City, and, and the depression starting from scratch. And that was what my second book was. Now my third book is House Fire, Fire, Financial Independence, Retire Early, How I Did It Through Real Estate Investing. And to be honest, that is what I recommend. And I wish I knew in my 20s, um, instead of the lean fire principles, House Fire is all about living in abundance. And it, the payoff is much, much better than being on a constrained budget and, you know, eating day old bagels. You know, you, no one's no one's excited to talk to you at a bar about how you can save money that <laughs> way. But people will talk to me all day about how you can make millions in real estate. <laughs> Yeah, the day old bagels thing makes me really sad just thinking about it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, the lean fire thing. I forget. There's a ton of different definitions. I forget exactly what it said in your book, but it's what like twenty five. You can live up twenty five thousand a year, something like that. That's right. Twenty. Yeah. If you have annual uh, expenses of twenty five thousand dollars a year, you qualify for lean fire, and you have to save twenty five times that, which I think is like one point two million dollars. So you have to be a millionaire. And live way below your means, you know, in a yurt somewhere in the middle of America. And that's not exciting to anyone, so which is why I, I created House Fire and, and that you don't have to live on a budget. You don't have to live uh, below your means. And actually, each year in financial independence, you get richer and richer as rental income goes up, property values go up, and your debt goes down. I think twenty five thousand is less than a million, but the the average of what oh, people yeah, you're right. the, the average of what people make though is around fifty, which would that does add up, if you will, to 1.2 million. So even if you're just kind of average with what you make, you still need to be, you still need to save 1.25 million if you're going to go the traditional route of saving up a portfolio of, you know, stocks, bonds, whatever, and live off 4% of that. Yeah. And it's, I, I assume your audience is familiar with the fire principles, but the, the the one example I give is imagine a hundred and fifty dollar internet bill. Like you're you're going to that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. You can't shed a hundred fifty dollar internet bill, bill unless you're willing to do all your online activity, watching Netflix and chilling <laughs> with your boyfriend or girlfriend at the library. You're you're always going to pay a hundred fifty dollar internet bill. Fire traditional fire principles are well twenty five you know twelve months of that is eighteen hundred dollars. T- multiply that by 25, that's $45,000. That is a lot of money to save up right now so that you can read emails forwarded from your aunt for the rest of your life. So quickly, the, the house fire principle is, hey, just save up half that. Let, let's call it $20,000. I can promise you all day for $20,000, you can go buy a property for a hundred thousand dollars, it doesn't might, might not be in your hometown. It might be an hour away. It might be in another state. But you hire a property manager, and you can make you buy a hundred thousand dollar property, put twenty percent twenty percent down, which is twenty thousand dollars, and that's going to cash flow you one hundred and fifty dollars a month. Those deals are all over America. Yep. So right there, instead of saving up for forty five thousand dollars to pay for your internet bill, you did it for less than half, which is twenty thousand dollars. And then what happens is your internet bill is going to go up. That's going to screw up the traditional fire plan, but not the yeah. house fire plan because your rent goes up and your mortgage and your mortgage payment goes down. So each year you have more and more money to spend on internet or spend on something else. Maybe it's you know in five years you have enough money to pay for internet and your Netflix account. And then in seven years, you're, you can add Hulu like because your, your spread and your delta and your income gets better and better. And that's including a property manager managing it all for you so that it's completely passive, just like stocks are. Yep. Love it. And then um, just to, I guess, complete the lean fire, fat fire thing that we were talking about. Um, so lean fire, 25,000. Fat fire is like 100,000 or more, right? Kind of around the $100,000 range. Fat fire is 100,000, which uh, you need 25 times that, 2.5 million. Mo fire, I don't know if you've heard that phrase, that's morbidly <laughs> yeah. obese fire. Someone was trying to say, well, I want to live larger than fat fire. So they came up with mo fire and that's $200,000 in annual expenses, which is $5 million saved. And to me, that's peanuts. That's not what House Fire teaches. We teach Hell Fire. Hell stands for having every luxury in life and financial independence retire early, which is 
$500,000 in annual expenses. And that means you have to save 12.5 million. And then everyone's like, oh, that's great. Of course, if I had 12.5 million, of course I could have a hellfire. But I also lay out that, well, you don't really need to save 12.5 million. You do on traditional fire pr uh, principles for half that, let's say 6.2 million, which is still a ton of money, but you can go buy a commercial real estate property that kicks off $45,000 a month, which is insane. That's where you're going to have every luxury in life. And so it's a combination of buying real estate, leveraging it um, with a mortgage. You can get these extreme, extreme numbers. So if we kind of dial it down, to fat fire, which is $100,000 in annual expenses, you have to save $2.5 million. My methods mean, tell you, you only have to save half of that, which is like $1.25 million, which is tr a traditional fire of $50,000 a year. But using house fire, you can double that and actually level up to fat fire if you do it through real estate and leveraging with mortgages. Yeah, that's awesome. I, my husband and I have talked about this a lot because I, you know the 4% rule you know, for listeners, that's the idea that um, basically your portfolio is going to go up by more than 5% on year on average. So you, if you use 4% of it every year, you can kind of keep your principal and, you know, live out your life or whatever. But that doesn't work for real estate. My husband and I have talked about that a lot. We're like, so what's our number? If we're in our, right now, our goal is to be 50 50, you know, basically stocks and real estate. We're a little more weighted towards real estate right now because we've done a couple things recently. But we've always talked about, okay, so we spend about $100,000 a year. So our number is 2.5 million, but is it really? It's kind of like 1.25 in stocks, but what's the number for the real estate? So I loved reading your book because that's that's given that a lot more concrete of a number. Yeah, it, it's it's taking buying right, an asset, and so there's another way I think about it. A lot of people are like, "Hey, I'm, I'm I'll buy a, I'll buy a real estate house, you know, rental house once I pay off my credit card debt, once I pay off my student loan bills, once I pay off my car note, uh, then I'll go buy a house." And the way I look at it is, no, 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 no. You go buy a house and have that cash flow pay for your car note. So if your car note's 300 bucks a month, um, go buy, a, save up and don't pay off the credit card or I'm sorry, don't pay off the car note because let's assume you have a, a Tesla and you're paying 300 bucks a month. If, if I'm, if I owe $35,000, I'm just going to hand over $35,000 to Elon Musk. Um, congratulations, go to Mars and go spend my money on Mars. <laughs> but what I like to do is say, no, 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 take that $35,000, go buy a rental property that kicks off $350,000. And have that, or sorry, $350. That $350 is going to pay for my car note. And then you fast forward in 10 years, my car note's paid off and I still have my $35,000, right? I didn't give it to Elon to go spend on Mars. I got to keep it because I bought myself an asset. And not only that, that asset's probably um, appreciated over the last 10 years as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, some people, I guess, maybe not a lot of people, think that you should pay cash for real estate, that you should pay off, not only pay off all of that stuff, in some instances, pay off your primary house even, and then invest in real estate. And your book is pretty clear that that's a terrible financial decision. Yeah. I was. Um, I thought you were going to argue me with me on this point. And I was about to leave this podcast. <laughs> uh, Yes, yes. So this is the way um, there, there's, uh, I could speak for five hours on why you should never have a paid off rental property. But some you know, quick examples are this. People are saying, hey, I want to, I have, I have $100,000 sitting in my closet, which, which is a problem that you know, most of us have. Um, so you have this $100,000 in your closet and, and you're like, I'm going to go buy a $100,000 house with it. Great. Okay. So uh, worst case scenario, that house burns to the ground damn it, I lost $100,000, right? What would have been the better way? Well, I could have taken that $100,000 and used a 20% payment and bought five different houses, right? Let's buy $100,000 house here with $20,000 of it, another $100,000 house with $20,000, spread that out. Now a house burns to the ground. Oh, okay, I only lost $20,000. No harm done. But you know, well, some harm done, but not, it's not, it doesn't hurt as much, but guess what? When you have a mortgage that you were required to have home insurance, not when you buy a house in all cash, no lenders forcing you to get home insurance. So some, mm -hmm. maybe you forgot about it. Maybe you didn't do it. Maybe you didn't, but because I did it with $20,000 and I used a mortgage uh, uh, company, they required me to have home insurance, but voila, they get to build me a brand new house because they forced me to have home insurance. So there, that, that's one reason why, um, I, I think you should spread out your money. A second reason would be, hey, 
let's assume that we think, hey, we're going to invest in real estate because we think property values are going to go up 10%. Well, if I bought one house in $100,000, in 10 years, my house is $110,000. Woohoo! I made $10,000. But if I took that $100,000, bought five houses, fast forward 10 years, it went up 10%. Hey, I made $50,000. I just 5x my wealth because I spread it out across five different homes. There's another reason, right? Um, and so another reason would be um, inflation. So a lot of people are really worried right now about inflation. Yep. And how do you hedge against inflation? And, and well, first, inflation is the cost of all goods and prices rising, rising, rising. Why does it happen? Because more dollars are being printed. If there's more dollars out there, your dollar is worth less. So let's assume that right now um, you're walking down the street and you found a Sacagawea coin on, on, on the sidewalk because people don't know what to do with Sacagawea coins. And you're like, hey, I got this. I don't want to I don't have a wallet anymore. Everything's you know cashless. Let me walk into this gas station and you buy a bag of candy. Right. So one dollar, one sack of Sacagawea coin is worth one uh, bag of candy right now. But you could also take that sack of Julia coin and mail it into your mortgage uh, primary residence mortgage company or your uh, rental company and pay off a dollar. So one dollar is worth one bag of candy or one paint dollar off your uh, mortgage payment. What, what you know? What would be the best choice? Well, let's also fast forward in ten, in the future where we think prices of everything are going to go up more or less. So. Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, you find that Sacagawea coin on the sidewalk, you walk into the candy store, well, a bag of candy is $2. So now you can buy a half a bag of candy. Well, that's sort of disappointing. But guess what? You can still mail that Sacagawea coin to your mortgage company and still get a dollar off, right? It's worth 50 cents in the real world, but in debt world, it's worth double. It's, it's worth a dollar. So this is why you should always kick the can down the road. Don't pay things off early. Wait to pay them off later when your dollar is worth more. Long-term debt is the best thing to hedge against inflation. This is why the national debt will never be paid off. We owe hundreds of millions of dollars to other countries, but it'll be cheaper for us if we pay it in tomorrow's dollars rather than today's dollars. Yes. And we are, I'm glad you brought up specifically the inflation portion of that because you know, we're hearing a lot, you know, about, I guess when this is posted, it'll be say July, but we keep hearing from the Fed when we're recording now in June of 2021, that there's not really inflation. It's a little more, it's being driven up by like specifically cars and lumber or whatever it is. And we're still going to be around the target of 2% inflation. Uh, listen, I went to Home Depot today to buy two toilets. I bought four of these toilets last year. They were $200 each. I bought two of them today. They were $250 each. All right. I bought right. some Adirondack chairs last year that were $19.99. Today, they were $22. Like it's not, I don't know. I'm not an economist, but prices of stuff that I buy have gone up in the last year. So um, that makes me feel really good that I just, that A, I refinanced my primary in January and just took out a uh, took out an 80% mortgage on great. another duplex last week. So. Yeah, great. And I always try to get 30-year loans. Don't try to get no. a 15-year loan just because that this this is this principle that I just described benefits you more and more the longer the term the debt. If you can get a 40-year loan, 50-year loan, do it all day. Do you think they'll ever do that? That's a total side note, but why not? Why don't yeah. why don't they do those? Why don't those um, exist? Yeah, I I I well, probably cuz the bank loses money after a while. They they recognize that. I know, but still, the average mortgage is like at most, at most like seven years long. So I think they'd come out all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll borrow your money on forty-year terms if that's what you're offering. <laughs> nope, not me. <laughs> okay. But I'll, I'll take that though on this end of things. <laughs> yes, right. right. <laughs> so, well, thank you for covering. Uh, talk to us about your books, um, the three different ones specifically: House Fire and How to Kill Your Bills by Buying Assets. There is one portion of your book. And I mentioned to you before we started recording that I think would really benefit my listeners. And it's how you talk about um, real estate, especially really residential real estate, because you have a great section of your book. And I think everybody should totally check it out where you talk about what beginners should not buy. Beginner real estate investors should not buy. And basically what it comes down to is you should buy residential real estate. And there's 
six rungs to that. So can we go over kind of, and um, let's not talk about what you shouldn't buy and all of the yeah, reasons. Yeah, sure. People yeah. can go buy your book and get that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so the, the rungs of real estate kind of from the bottom to the top, if we could talk about those so that people, I'm sure if anyone out there is uh, thinking about buying real estate, we've all had that question. Should I buy a single family, right? Then you start looking at single families. Maybe you start looking at condos, maybe you start thinking about duplexes or whatever. What what are the pros and cons of these six rungs? Sure. Well, you you said um, you were, you wanted everyone to read a specific section in my book. I, I imagine you mean page one uh, through page two hundred and fourteen. Yes, yes, but, okay. all of it, all okay, of it. Great, But I'm great, saying great, I'm going to yeah, tease that yes, specific. Yeah. Okay, part. okay, all right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I have six rungs of the property ladder, and I say. I tell everyone, I'm, I'm a realtor and, and I'm a real estate investor and I have clients and they want to be real estate investors and they come to me. And so I, the book has, has been a product of the, the million of questions asked over and over again to me, which seem to be the most the same questions from everyone. Um, and it's like, what do I invest in? And so a lot of people have analysis paralysis or first time or freeze. Um, because they don't, they're, they're, they're comparing too many different things. So I first have them narrow down on a property type. And a property type are on six rungs of ladder. And what I say is like, you can make a million dollars a million different ways in real estate. Just because you're on rung one, it doesn't mean you're going to be make bad decisions. Everyone has to start somewhere. I started at rung one and worked my way up. But as you level up onto different rungs on the property, rungs on the property ladder, it's going to be more profitable for you. So rung number one I have is an apartment condo or co-op, some sort of, um, you know, contained apartment building, but you own one unit with inside that. That is um, the easiest for a lot of people to start and because it, it's at a lower price point. Now, in terms of investing, um, I like to have as many outs and options as possible with my real estate. So apartment is very limited. I can't add square footage. Uh, I can't just carve out an extra five feet into the hallway without someone yelling at me. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I have an HOA, so possibly I, I couldn't do short-term rentals. HOA can change the rules all the time. They might not even let me do long-term rentals. If I want to do any renovations, the pipes and electric, uh, electricity are in the walls, and usually I can't touch that because it's connected to other pipes and possible circuit breakers of, of other units. So I really can just do cosmetic updates. I'm not saying don't avoid it. I'm not saying this is not a product that you should never invest in, but you're limited on what you can do. There's money to be made here, but you'll have much more options on rung number two, mm -hmm. which is a step up from apartments. So step well, yeah. So yeah. for condos, I, I know someone, I was buying furniture. I don't know which house this was I was buying furniture for, but I, we went and we went to a condo and I was like, oh, did you guys just buy this? Blah, blah, blah. They're like, no, we bought it like a year and a half ago with the plan to rent it out. And then we realized you had to live there for two years before you could rent it out. Yeah. Like what a mistake that right. is, right? You right. have to know, first of all, that's just how things were written then. Yeah. They could like HOA boards can change stuff along the way too. Oh, I don't know yeah. if they ever would add that in later or something, or they can certainly allow long term rentals and short term rentals, get rid of short term rentals, or define short term rentals as 90 days, which is not how I tend to define it. So that's some that's some really, really good points there. But like you said, um, there are some HOAs that are run really well that have really good reserves and you can go one step above and beyond and join the HOA, become the president, then you have a lot of control. That's really good. I think if you're going to buy more than one condo in that association. So I, I think I think you're right. Like there's definitely ways that you can make money doing that. But I also can see totally why it's rung number one on the ladder. Yeah. And and. It's also you're limited really on comp. So I, I sort of group in rung number two, which is a townhouse. Same sort of issues. You have an HOA if you have a townhouse and you're usually sharing a wall with someone. So you may be limited in what you can do. But sometimes townhomes, you can finish off the garage into a living space or there's an attic that you can finish off. You can actually add square footage within its own footprint. Um, but you may be beholden to the HOA rules. You also sometimes have a um, backyard that you can maybe, I don't know, put a koi pond in or something. You can actually <laughs> add add value to it. But the, it's all, I'm always looking for options, right? And, and what I can do to increase the value. But 
in both these rungs, you're very, very limited because your comps are going to come from the same community, the same complex. If you're doing a gut renovation and you put in, you know, let's say you buy an apartment in a 20 unit apartment building, everything has the exact same floor plan. You could replace everything inside with um, imported Italian marble and <laughs> tiles and you spend a million dollars on it, but you can't sell it for that. You can only sell it for the next highest comp within your building, which, you know, it could be $200,000. So you you always have a ceiling if um, you, you're buying in a community, it's like an apartment or a townhouse, the same sort of thing. You'll have some variety, a little bit more variety because it might be an end unit or it might be a middle unit. You might have done something with the garage or the porch, like I said, but you you still are probably going to be at a ceiling of the most expensive townhome that ever sold in that community because when an appraiser comes, that's the best thing because it's going to be like, oh, this has the same floor plan built at the same time. It's in the same location, the same school districts. Oh, you've got a little bit nicer tile, you know, well, great. You know, here, here's maybe a 2% premium instead of a 20% premium. Right. Yeah. Great point. And you've done both of those. You've had both. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I've done every rung. So yeah, I started apartment condo um, and then I sort of jumped around, but I've done everything. And so that's where I've sort of learned where I should focus moving forward. But everyone has to start somewhere. I know townhomes are typically more expensive than apartment condos. And as we go up the rungs, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but there's more options for you as a real estate investor. So what's rung number three? Three is just your typical bread and butter single family. So this is probably a house that people grew up in. It could be a suburban home. It could be, um, you know, uh, more urban, but a detached single family home. What I like about this is you, I, I also, I would say, try to avoid HOAs if, if possible, because then you could, you could do options. Typically with a single family home, you don't, you don't need anyone's permission to renovate it. Um, you know, if there's no HOA, you don't, you don't need permission to park cars in, in, in your grass either. So, so that's, um, that, that could be the con, but, um, depending on what you want to do, you can bump it up, you can bump it out. Um, you have yard that you could repurpose. You could move the driveway from the left to the right. If it's on a less busy street, if it's like a corner lot, like you can do all these things to increase the value of your home. And they're not necessarily just going to look at homes within your neighborhood. They're going to look at, oh, you might have the only 4,000 square foot house in this neighborhood because you did this great addition. Well, let's compare it when we get an appraisal done to the 4,000 square foot home in the neighborhood, um, you know, four blocks away or half a mile down the street. Like you're now comparing yourself to other neighborhoods, not within your own neighborhood. And so you have a lot of, a lot more options uh, and you could, you could actually rezone um, properties potentially. If it's next to a commercial property, you could maybe get your property rezoned to commercial, which would mm -hmm. add value. You could maybe apply for a variance to make it duplex or multifamily high density city housing. Um, you have all sorts of these different like playing cards and lottery tickets, you know, that, oh, how, how can I really unlock the value of this property? Oh yeah. So do you want to tell them what you, how, why you think of real estate kind of as a portion of your real estate purchase being a lottery ticket? Yeah. So, so, um, a lot, so a lot of times when I'm talking about renovating properties and adding value, that's called forced appreciation. I am forcing this appreciation to happen with my own blood, sweat, tears, and money. I'm renovating this property, right? Um, other part of appreciation is um, sort of just passive appreciation, which means you do nothing and the property value appreciates. So what that means is, hey... Um, and I call this lottery ticket, right? So I want, that's another reason I want to buy as many properties as I possibly can, because I get a lot of these imaginary lottery tickets, which come with passive appreciation. So I did this in Brooklyn, New York, before anyone wanted to live in New York or Brooklyn. Um, and I bought a few properties and um, I got a million dollar equity on two different properties because the... Um, Brooklyn Nets moved to Brooklyn from New Jersey. New Jersey Nets moved to Brooklyn Nets. I didn't know this was coming, but I instead of buying one property on cash, I bought two properties, two townhomes, and they both added a million dollars equity once this passive appreciation lottery ticket event occurred for me. And so that's... So that's why I'm like, spread out your money as much as possible because you don't know what's going to happen. It could... Maybe you won't have a basketball team move into your town, but you could have a charter school open up in your rental property district. 
you, you could have a new park that goes in. Um, you could have, um, you know, a new highway come, come have an exit, um, a new grocery store moves in. Like if they say, if a whole foods or a Starbucks moves in, um, within a half mile or a mile of your property, you pretty much get a instant lottery ticket, things like wow. that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love that. It's basically like, you can't run the numbers assuming something like that is going to happen. You have to run the numbers with like semi-conservative or normal appreciation, but but you might hit that lottery ticket. Okay, that was just a side note um, from our six rungs. Yes, okay. Um, so moving on up to number four. So number four is uh, vacation rental properties. And I sort of look at these as more expensive of the first three rungs. Because you could have a vacation rental that's apartment condo. You could have one that's a townhouse. You could have one that's a single family. But they're a little bit more expensive. And with by by that, I mean you're – you're in a desirable area, right? If someone's willing to vacation there, you're probably on a beach, on a mountain, on a ski slope, on a lake, um, somewhere, you know, urban city center, somewhere where people want to visit. So the prices are, are, are high and you get to charge higher prices. It's a little bit more risky, more risk, more reward because you're, you're basically running a hotel in that regards because you have weekly guests as short-term rentals rather than long-term rentals. But it, there's also typically higher insurance that comes with it because mm-hmm. you might need fire insurance. If you're in the m- woods, you might need um, mudslide insurance or hurricane insurance or tornado or, you know, who, who knows what. It, 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 it's just Everything's just more expensive. It doesn't mean don't do it. It's just a little bit more risk, but because it's a little bit more risk, you usually make a little bit more money. Absolutely. The insurance in Florida is absolutely it's go, it's just it's going insane right now. Yeah. So yeah, so that brings me to rung number 5 which helps in that case, uh <laughs> which is small multifamily. And small multifamily is um you can get a regular loan for it just like you would a primary residence as long as it's four units or fewer. So this could be a duplex, a triplex or a quadruplex. And so what I like is that you're scaling uh your expenses here. So if I if I had the money to buy four uh, single family homes in a vacation area, I have four insurance bills. But guess Mm -hmm. what? If I condensed all that and I bought a quadruplex on the beach, well, I still, I, 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 I now only have one insurance bill. Not only that, I have one roof to worry about instead of yep. four roofs. I have one pest control bill instead of four pest control bills. Like you're, you're scaling your expenses down. And so that is why I like, look, um, um, multifamily. And that's my bread and butter. That That is where I, I, I really think everyone should try to invest if it's in your area, if you can. Um, and because then also you're you're, you're basically just reducing risk over and over again. Um, so consider um, a single family house that's vacant and you only have one. Well, you're, you're, you're losing money every month because you still have that mortgage payment. You still have property taxes. You still have insurance. But if you have a quadruplex or you have a duplex, let's say you have a duplex, one unit is vacant. Well, the other side is still making you money. So you might be breaking even that month. And you know, that, that other side will probably be paying your mortgage and maybe some of your um, property taxes and insurance bills. Um, you're not profiting, but you're not losing money. So mm-hmm. if you have a quadruplex, it works the same way. You're still making money with three units uh, if one of them's vacant. Um, so you're just sort of scaling up your income and reducing your risk that way. Yeah, I was really grateful for that during COVID. We have a duplex and the one side's carrying the weight of the other this whole time, you know, and there's been, um, I had to get it tented uh, for termites. I had to get a new roof. There's been some plumbing issues and I am making absolutely no money on it except for, you know, I guess I have maybe some losses I can harvest because of depreciation in the future, but I, I was really happy. It is nice to have still some money coming in, even though we can't evict or anything on the other side right now. Yeah. And, and this is what this is another reason I like small multifamilies because typically they have the same floor plan where the left side is the same as the right side or the upstairs is the same as the downstairs. And so I can always test the market with my renovations. Yeah. So um, you could renovate one unit, spend a lot of money and say, hey, I'm going to ask a thousand more dollars uh, in, in rental income now that the, the site's vacant. And then you put it on the market. And if you don't get it, 
then you're like, okay, well, I'm not going to make that renovation again on the, you know, this downstairs unit, right? You've tested the market. But if you do get it, then you're like, oh, home run. I, I just have to make the exact same renovations in this other floor plan, and I'm going to increase the value that way. With a single family house, it's kind of difficult to do because they're so unique already, and whether you're in a floodplain or not, mm-hmm. how busy the street is. But with, with, because it's all under one roof, you can really push the rents uh, off each other to see how far – uh, you can go and what renovations are needed to, to kind of really push the rents up. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think anybody has said that before on uh, on this podcast. So that's a good one. So last rung. Last rung. So rung six. So recap, we've got rung one, apartment condo, r- rung two, townhouse, rung three, single family, rung four, vacation rental, rung five, small multifamily, rung six, commercial multifamily. So these are basically what I just mentioned, except – Commercial is technically five units or more, and then all you get is the the bigger risk reduction that I talked about, and you're now no longer at the whim of appraisals of other similar properties. So a commercial property is basically a business, and it's evaluated as such, and that how much income, what's the net operating income? Take the gross operating income, take out all the expenses. The net operating income is what your business, what your property is worth. So if I had a small multifamily, like a quadruplex, and I squeezed out an extra hundred bucks by charging the tenants a hundred dollars for parking, um, I, I made 400 bucks more in this on this quadruplex, but it doesn't increase the value because the appraiser doesn't really look at the rental income. They're just going to look at what other quadruplexes have sold in the area. But if I do that on a commercial side, I've instantly increased the value and and it'll appraise higher. I can do a cash out refi for higher. I can sell it for higher. Is you know if I find a way to put solar panel on the roof and reduce the expenses, that doesn't change anything about the value on a small multifamily. But that crazily changes the value on a commercial property because now I've taken away some of the landlord expenses. So um, any sort of tweak you do to make it a more profitable property, you instantly see that in your value. So is that primarily what you're doing right now? Or have you switched like you're down, you're all the way down your flywheels, you've gone around and around um, in residential, have you moved on to even beyond that, like true, true commercial? Yes. I I, I am only focusing on commercial with my own personal deals, but I currently have 50 single family homes, uh, 10 uh, small multifamilies and a bunch of other pro- uh, properties. So it took me a while to, before I built up the confidence to kind of really focus on commercial. So if you can start there, that's great. But I've, I've been real estate investing for 20 years and it's took, taken me 20 years to realize that this is where I need to be right now. And so I, that's why I say it doesn't matter what wrong. You can make money in whatever wrong. But if you are comfortable or you have a mentor or if you have someone in your life that has experience at a higher rung than what you're qu- currently operating in, or if you're selling a property and you want to do a 1031 exchange, I highly recommend you do that 1031 into a higher rung for greater returns. Yep. Love that. Yeah. And that's definitely at least a little bit how my path has been. I've done uh, three, four, and five of the ladder, and I'm working on uh, rung number six right now. And I can definitely say that the confidence goes a long way. And if you're relatively in a close area too, you can get, you know, like we bought, like I said, we bought a duplex last week and I just, you know, called up the people that did my reno of my current primary that I'm house hacking and just called them up and had this, they're, they're demoing the floors tomorrow. And I've had this scheduled since I went under contract on the place, you know, like yeah, some right. of that, it just, it just helps you just, you gain the confidence and you just, you get the reps in and you get more comfortable and we'll see, we'll see how I, how I feel once I kind of graduate out of small multis, but that's, that's where I'm living my life right now. I just, I do love those, those mortgage rates. Are, are, you, are you, are you managing them yourself or do you have a property manager? I have a property manager for the one that is in the class D neighborhood. Yeah. Um, the vacation rentals I am managing myself and, um, this new one's going to be half vacation, half Long term, because there's a very long, long term lease that I've inherited. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to manage that one too. So it's kind of a mix. I see. I mean, another way to scale is um, if you have all the same property type, typically a property manager is going to take 10% of uh, your income. But if you 
call up a property manager and say, hey, I've got 10 units, um, which are easier to get when you start investing in these commercial properties, or you've got five duplexes, so that's 10 units. Typically, when you get 10 units or more, you can negotiate a lower rate with your property manager and get it down to 9%. But when, when I call someone and say, hey, I've got 50 units, and I've gotten them down as low as 5%. So the more wow. units you get, the, the cheaper things get uh, for you, uh, more you, you can negotiate better with your vendors. My plumbers show up faster now yes. that I've got 50 units rather than when I had one unit, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm even noticing that a little bit now that pe- you know people are more likely to pick up my phone call because they've done stuff for me two or three times in the la- even in just the last year. So yeah, that's right. definitely true. And I, I I love that idea. And I think 10% is even low in some cases. I think now some areas are 12% or they take 10 plus a month's rent every time they flip it. It's really, it ends up being more than that, um, which if you run your numbers, that's fine. It can work basically no matter right. what that cost is. But um, yeah, if I invest some more in St. Pete, um, we'll see. I did go a, a little bit outside of the of St. Pete so I could buy more stuff. But um, all right. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? For people listening, a lot of times this all seems very intimidating. And so I always try to break it down into really simple terms, which I put mm-hmm. in my books. But it, it, it's it's really focusing on that rung is where you start. And then you can add another layer to it and say, hey, I'm going to focus on Rung three, single family. And then you just have to add some criteria to it mm-hmm. within 45 minutes of my house or within a half mile to a subway stop, only in this zip code or school district. Because what you're doing is narrowing your focus. Because if, if, if you just pick one wrong single family and you're looking at one in Texas and one in Georgia and then one uh, down the street from you, you're going to be like, which one do I buy? I, I don't know. This one's uh, got this pros, this one, this uh, cons, this one's this, this one's that. And you're just sort of all over the place. But if you say, hey, I'm only looking within 45 minutes of my house or within the school district, then you look at three single family homes. Let's call it five. Maybe you look at five single family homes. One is going to jump out at, at, at you, right? One is going to be like, oh, I've looked at five within my price range, within the same geographic area, within the same product type. They're all single families. One is going to jump out at you, and then you buy that one. And that, that, that'll that help. Also, if you take one bill in your life and say, I hate this bill the most in my life, <laughs> look at it. Oh, it's $87 a month. Okay, let me go find a property that makes me at least $87 a month, and I'm going to buy that property and burn up the bill through house fire or kill that bill with a real estate investment. That is another way to overcome that first time or freeze or analysis paralysis, and then just buy it. Okay, $87 done. Okay, what's the next bill I hate the most? Go buy that property. Go buy that property. And then eventually, all your bills are paid for through real estate. And then you got to go out and invent payments. You're going to be like, (laughs) that's when you go buy that Tesla, right? Then you're going to go, oh, I'm not going to go buy a Tesla. I'm going to go buy a house that pays for the Tesla. I don't want to go on vacation for a month in Hawaii. I'm going to go buy a real estate property that's going to pay for my vacation for a month in Hawaii. And, And that's the way you sort of think about it. Yeah, your book did a great job of walking through, okay, here's what you avoid. Here's the six rungs of the ladder, you know, pick one, maybe go as high up as you as you feel comfortable. Think about what kind of class you want, class A neighborhood all the way through class D neighborhood, location, right? I thought you did a really good job of taking something that it can be very overwhelming. I mean, I think you're dead on 1 million ways to make $1 million in real estate. That number might even be off. Like there's so many different ways that you can do it and it can get really overwhelming. Um, So I think everyone should read your book and think through, you know, who they are as an investor, who they are as a person. And I love the idea of, uh, you know, basically killing these bills that way. That's there's, there's no better motivator than trying to get rid of a bill to me anyways. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it, it, and it, it makes it fun because then, then, it, then you can really afford everything. Because, because all you, once you kill one bill, you save faster because you got one bill out of your life, and then you kill a second bill, you're saving even more. So then you start buying houses faster and faster than you thought was possible. But that's because you've got one house paying for the bills, right? And yeah. then, and then eventually you you're just saving like crazy. Let's go buy another house. Let's go buy another house. And so it's. Uh, but I also I also say you don't have to be a real estate mogul to be financial independent. You, that doesn't have to be your goal. But if you buy four houses, maybe five houses, you could probably erase all your current bills in your life. It's really that simple. But if you want to take it and want to grow and you want to buy 100 properties, 
just just continue the same blueprint. That's all it takes. I feel like once you get five, you might as well just get a hundred. You're probably oh, you're gonna, addicted. You're to probably going to get addicted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're going to fall in love. You're going to be like, why did I not do this two years ago when I first listened to that podcast with Lauren? Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Perfect. So let me wrap up then. So managing money is a huge part of adulting and managing money involves um, investing and certainly real estate is one way to do that. And there's a lot of ways to invest in real estate. So read House Fire to learn more about you the best path for you and uh, why you really should get into it now. What about where people can get in touch with you, Alan? Sure. Uh, my name is Alan Corey. My friends call me AC and I record and teach from my house. So all my social media uh, channels are the house of AC. If you Google it, you're going to learn a lot about air conditioning. So don't do that. Just search <laughs> for the house of AC. But did you do that before? Like SEO is like a big thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I yeah, I did not do a whole lot of due diligence on my branding, uh, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't change your initials, really. So. Yeah, right, right. All right, I'll put I'll put that in the show notes. And everyone, you can follow me on Twitter at Adulting Is Easy. I'm also on Facebook. You can email me at realadultingiseasy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening. Hopefully, we've made adulting a little easier for you.